Good morning and welcome. Anyone who's coming in, we'll give people a few minutes to join. You can see the participants are streaming in. Um, we have a lot to discuss today. So as people are joining, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick things off with some announcements. Um, if you're not familiar, I am Nan Swift. I'm um, the Governance Fellow at R Street, where I work on budget, depending on budget and um, ag issues, um, as well as congressional modernization. The R Street Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization, and our mission is to engage in policy, research, and outreach to promote free markets and a limited effective government uh, through pragmatic solutions. Um, we're very pleased to be hosting this budget briefing today. This is an annual event um, coordinated through the Pentagon Budget Coalition. It's a transpartisan, I'm gonna use that word, <laughs> Wendy, <laughs> group of organizations from across the ideological spectrum who are united in our goal to reduce wasteful Pentagon spending. And um, another quick announcement is that if you have additional um, questions about anything that the speakers say today, given that this is a very complex issue and we have a short amount of time to unpack things, please feel free to contact me at R Street or any of uh, the speakers to get more information from them directly. Um, and now I am so pleased to introduce our speakers today. We have a great lineup. Um, before we all joined, I asked everyone, what are you most looking forward to getting to do this summer now that COVID restrictions seem to be retreating? And I got some great answers. First, we have Mark Kansian. He's a senior advisor with the um, CSIS International Security Program. Um, he joined that after many years at the Office of Management and Budget, worked at the Pentagon, um, and also served in the Marines for three decades. And we'll have everyone's full bios in a link in the chat shortly. And he is looking forward to gathering indoors with other people. Last weekend, he went to the Banff Film Festival, which was held in person at National Geographic, and that must have been wonderful and we will have to tell Senator Soshana, our um, intrepid social media manager about that. She is in love with BAM. Um, we also have Monica Montgomery, who's the advocacy coordinator for the Council for a Livable World, where her work focuses on building congressional champions for nuclear arms control and non-proliferation and a reduced Pentagon budget. And she is looking forward to the full return of live music. This is a common theme. She's already got tickets to a handful of upcoming shows around the DMV this spring and summer. We also have with us Ben Freeman, who is a research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. His work focuses on how foreign governments seek to influence American government and politics. He is also looking forward to watching live music with full crowds. He saw Elton John this past Saturday in a packed arena and says it was absolutely electric. Um, so we welcome questions on that, very important. And finally, we have Wendy Jordan, who is a senior policy analyst with the Taxpayers for Common Sense, where she works on issues related to national security and has done so for more than 30 years. Um, she is looking forward to the return of in-person antique shows. Buying antique, antique from online auctions is not the same, and she apparently has experience in that area. Um, and she also might go to London with some of her friends to celebrate um, the 40th anniversary of um, their time at the London School of Economics. So great people with a lot of different experiences. And before we turn to our panel, where we'll be discussing the, the president's budget request, what we anticipate this year, what the challenges might be in the upcoming appropriations season, 
Um, we've asked Ben to please set the stage and give us some context for where we are. In the meantime, if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A box. We will try to get to as many as possible throughout the event. Take it away, Ben. Okay, thank you so much, Nan. Well, they say a, a picture speaks a thousand words. Uh, with the Pentagon budget, uh, I, I'd like to say a picture speaks uh, 773 billion words. So I'm gonna share with you a quick chart to, to help put this current budget in perspective. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that okay. And what, what this chart shows in a nutshell is the DOD budget authority going back to 1948. Uh, and, and it is controlling for inflation. And I know, I know, I know, there's so many questions about inflation. We'll, 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 we'll definitely get into that, particularly with this year's budget. Um, but, but this does control for inflation to try and put um, the, the current budget in historical perspective. And it, it, at least three things I hope jump out from this chart right away. The first one is that our current levels are historically high. Uh, they're well above the levels of, of spending that we saw at the height of the Korean War, the height of the Vietnam War, the, the height of the Cold War, in fact, the height of the, 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 the momentous uh, Reagan buildup. We're, we're actually a little over uh, $100 billion higher in spending than we were even, even at that peak of Cold War levels. Uh, we are, however, below the spending levels of the peaks of the, the Afghanistan and Iraq wars and in, in, in the late aught years there around 2010. Um, and we are, for the first time, we're seeing an increase um, in, in a con post-conflict for the very first time. What, what, what you'll notice from the chart, and this is my second point, is that it, after every major conflict, we get, we get a surge in spending because of the conflict. And this is sort of a fact of life with defense budgeting is that our, our budgets very often respond to our wars and the threat environment that we face. So when we go to war, uh, as we did in Korea and Vietnam, we'll see a surge in defense spending because of those wars. And then we see a decline in defense spending uh, after those wars end. But if you notice from the chart, we never actually go back down to those pre-war levels. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We never fully end our wars from a, a budgetary perspective. Uh, we leave troops behind, we leave bases behind, uh, and, and in many cases, we leave a, a lot of bureaucracy intact. Uh, finally, the, the, the third thing I, I, I would say about this budget uh, is that we're, you, you see a, a, a clear trend uh, in this chart uh, over the last uh, 70 plus years, and that it keeps on going up and up and up. Regardless of our wars, you know, we get peaks and valleys because of the wars and the conflicts, but we do see a, a, a steady trend of going up and up and up here. What's not shown on this chart is how our capabilities and our, the, the level of military equipment and capacity that we have matches up with this. And in, in a some, somewhat counterintuitive sense, as our budget has gone up and up and up, our military capabilities, our equipment, our personnel have actually gone down. My, my good colleague at the Quincy Institute, Bill Hartung, who I'm sure many of you know, he's a, he's a vaunted defense budget analyst. We, we have a piece going up in the Hill later this week uh, where we talk about this disconnect. And in, in effect, what we've been doing is spending more and more for less and less. We compare uh, the, the current state of the military to the 1985 Reagan buildup, and on just about every metric, uh, we find that the Reagan's military was significantly larger than our own. Uh, the Air Force was about twice as big, uh, the Navy also about twice as big, uh, and we now have about a third less troops than we did at the height of the Reagan buildup. And then you pick the metric, uh, it was much bigger in 1985 than it is today. Now, some folks might say, well, that's because of quality uh, issues rather than quantity issues. Uh, but we argue that it's some of our biggest programs that are our are, are, are most advanced programs are most problematic from a budgetary point of view. So the question I would like to leave you with at the end of this uh, historical context briefing is, uh, why do you think that this is happening? Why do we appear to be spending more and more for less and less? And fortunately, to help answer that question, uh, I'm joined by an, an just unbelievable all-star panel of some of my favorite budget experts. And so I'll leave it at that for my, for my historical roundup. Thank you, Ben. And that's a really good question. Why are we spending more for less? Why are we spending um, so much more now? This is 
uh, biggest defense budget that um, that we've seen in maybe forever, <laughs> but certainly in decades. Uh, and um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, we are also living in remarkable times with a lot of um, things going on around the globe. So I'd like to ask everyone um, just really quickly, when the president's budget request came out, what was your first reaction? And if I could, I'll call on people to try to prevent confusion and over talk, but what did you think when you saw this? Wendy? Oh, sure, start with me. Uh, well, my first thought, my first thing that I looked for was to make sure that the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund and Mark and I have different views on this, uh, and I'm sure he'll get into it. But my first thing that I looked for was, has the OCO uh, account snuck back in? Uh, so that was my first question, and the answer was no, at least so far. We'll see what Congress does. Uh, and my second reaction was, wow, that's a lot of money uh, in discretionary spending, but uh, there's also a big strategy and the, the spending to my eye pretty much lines up with the strategy. It's an expensive strategy. Mark, was that your reaction? I, it was, you know, I, they added a lot of money after Congress added money. And I think that followed the strategy that they were articulating, which was very forward leaning um, in the Pacific and Europe and even keeping a, um, uh, a force in the Middle East. Um, I do need to push back on a couple of things that Ben said. I mean, the first thing is in dollars, constant dollars, this is a high budget. If you look at burden on the economy, it's historically low. Uh, we're about 3.3% of GDP. I mean, that's sort of 1940s low. Uh, in 1950s, we're at sort of six, 8%. So in terms of burden, it's historically low. In terms of capability, you can argue both ways. There's no question the forces are smaller. You know, people are much more expensive. Um, what the military would argue is if you took today's fleet and put it up against the Reagan fleet, the Reagan fleet would be destroyed quickly uh, because the, today's fleet just has much, much more capability. So you, you, know, you pay for those capabilities. I mean, we could buy that fleet you know, for a relatively uh, small uh, amount of money, but it just wouldn't be worthwhile. And, and the last thing I'd point out is that yes, the budget starts going up in about 2015, uh, because what happened then is that you had, you know, several world events. You mean, first you have, of course, Russia taking over Crimea and then moving into the Donbass. You have ISIS, you know, flowing out of the desert there and threatening uh, the Middle East. And then you have the Chinese being very assertive. So there was a change in uh, perspective, and that's what caused the, the budget to turn around. Monica, what was your first impression when you saw the budget drop? I think wow, similar to Mark and Wendy would be an accurate description. I, I we all knew that the the top line number was going to be high given world events and uh, last year's budget, but I think seeing that actual number was a bit of a, a sticker shock for a moment. Um, but then going past that, digging into the nuclear weapons budget was really um, when uh, some initial reactions came. Um, when Biden came into office, a lot of people expected some changes in, in nuclear weapons programs, small changes, um, but some changes. And I, I think that that is, uh, is not what we have seen. Uh, essentially, nuclear weapons spending went up over 18% from just last year alone. Um, this is a part of an, an essentially an incoming, if not here, bow wave on nuclear modernization that we've long been protect, uh, projecting to happen and is a part of the larger nearly $2 trillion plan to upgrade and sustain our nuclear forces. Um, but seeing nearly every program move forward, including some of the more controversial ones, like the ground-based strategic deterrent, the long-range standoff weapon, um, the new W93 sub-launch warhead was a bit of a surprise, um, not that much of a surprise. Uh, and then there's a few other programs that we'll dig into a little bit that there were small cuts. To be fair, we actually haven't seen these changes in the budget yet because we don't have the budget documents out that talk about these changes. Um, that's because we don't have the NNSA detailed budget documents. We don't have the DOD's budget documents. So really just working off original press releases, news reports, and some, some basic numbers that the, the Pentagon has given us in addition to um, 
the major program acquisition um, book that they provide that talks about some of these nuclear weapons programs. So I think it's a bit of wow, a bit of okay, and what's we need more to really dig into this. Yeah. Ben, your your first impression. Didn't we just end a war? <laughs> I, 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 similar to everybody else, I, the, the, there was definitely a moment of sticker shock for me, but uh, I, I, I suppose I was naively assuming we would get some sort of peace dividend, maybe, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit of savings um, from ending one of the longest conflicts in U.S. history, the longest conflict in, in, uh, in, in U.S. history, uh, but uh, that did not come to pass, and that was, that was very surprising to me. I'll say my first reaction honestly was confusion. Are these the actual numbers? What are these numbers based on? There was a lot of confusion among uh, reporters and others. Uh, a lot of documents were missing. Um, what does this have to do with inflation? Are these numbers that we can trust? Um, ben, can you speak more to that? Yeah, it was. I. I, I... I feel for everyone on this panel, uh, we're such wonderful budget focused people. We want to dive in, you know, we, we, we want to go into those the appendices. We want to get into that green book. You know, we want all of it. We want to hear about your inflation assumptions. Um, what we got from the administration, unfortunately, on so many of these issues was uh, kick the can. They, 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 they sort of punted on, on giving us the full details of the budget. They punted on inflation, frankly, if, and, and, and this came up in, in, in congressional hearings, it keeps coming up. Um, their inflation assumptions were made back in November, well before the current uh, it, it surge in inflation has happened. Um, and they didn't offer a clear explanation for how they're going to address inflation going forward. So for budget analysts like us, and this is why I put the caveat on my chart, like this, uh, the, the chart only goes off of the, the, the inflation estimates that we have from the administration. And the administration even admits that those are not the right numbers for inflation. So I think it, it, all of this has created a lot of frustration for budget folks like us. Um, Wendy. One of the things that you always pay very close attention to are the wish lists that services put out. But we've also seen other big differences between what, the, what was in the president's budget, what services have now said that they need, as well as the um, unfunded priorities list. Can you unpack that a bit? Sure. Uh, I'm going to go back in history um, to when I was a young congressional staffer and um, uh, there was a member of Congress from Missouri, uh, a member of the House named Ike Skelton. And Mr. Skelton was on the House Armed Services Committee. And sometime, I'm going to say it was in the late 80s or early 90s. Mark may remember more in greater detail than I do. Um, Mr. Skelton just sort of, I think off the cuff, asked one of the service chiefs that who was testifying um, at the beginning of the of the cycle we have what we derisively refer to as the dog and pony show uh, budget hearings um, uh, Mr. Skelton asked one of the service chiefs is there anything that didn't make it into the budget request that you really wish you had and I mean you could sort of see the the um, emotions running across the service chief's face. Yes, uh, but do I answer that question? Uh, and I, I, my recollection is that the service chief, and I don't remember which service it was, gave a sort of vanilla answer, you know, yes, of course, things always drop out in the, in the process between the services and OSD and the Office of Management and Budget, something not responsive, uh, at least not in, with any specifics. Uh, so that morphed into Mr. Skelton asking every service chief when they would come up for a list. And the service chiefs would typically say, uh, I'll provide that for the record. You know, they wouldn't get into it in the hearing. And then uh, a, a short list. I remember one time um, uh, the special forces guys had like 19 items on their list. And we were like, whoa, I mean, that was considered a big list back then. Uh, 
And so this became sort of part of the theater of the budget hearings. Ask for it, the service chiefs say, well, we'll get back to you. Um, and uh, the list would you know, come over the transom as we used to say. Uh, and so when there was a little wiggle room in the budget, uh, the committees, uh, the appropriations committees, because those, those are the committees that can actually affect what you actually spend money on, uh, would add items from the top of the list, maybe the first one or two or three items from each of the military services. Um, when Robert Gates became the, um, well, actually before Robert Gates, uh, another service, an, another uh, Secretary of Defense said, we're, they used to be called the unfunded requirements list, the URLs. And as a uh, certain curmudgeonly Secretary of Defense said, if it's not in the budget, it's not a requirement, so stop calling it a, a requirement. And they started calling it uh, unfunded priorities. Uh, uh, then Secretary Gates came in and he said, knock it off. You're not responding to these requests and you're not, you know, the budget is the budget and that's what it is. And you don't get an extra gimme. Uh, you don't get a mulligan. And uh, that led to Congress requiring them statutorily and also to requiring them not just from the service chiefs. It used to be the service chiefs and then the service chiefs and SOCOM. Uh, it's now every combatant commander. Uh, I joke that it's everybody who has uh, uh, membership in the Pentagon executive mess uh, now is able to do an unfunded priorities list. I, um, and at Taxpayers for Common Sense, we view this as um, uh, an, un want, an unnecessary mulligan. Uh, this year, I think it was the, um, the Navy, when they did their unfunded priorities list, they actually dated it March 24th. The budget was dated March 28th. So before the <laughs> budget was even dropped, the Navy was saying, but we need this too. Uh, and, you know, so that's the background. We find them um, an unfortunate end run around the normal budget process. Uh -huh. let, let, me, let me jump in and oh, say please. something in yeah. favor of the lists. Uh, uh, first, one thing that struck me on the list this year was that there were no people on it. Um, they did not try to increase end strength despite the fact that you know some of the services took hits. So that was that was interesting. But the reason I, I think I, I, I'm you know, not as opposed to the list is, you know, when Congress is going to ask money, add money, they're going to add money someplace. So do you want them to add money where the members want to add money, or do you want to have them add money where the services want them to add money? And I'd much rather have them go where the services want rather than making it a political um, negotiation about whose state gets how much money in this plus some. So it, it provides, I think, a useful template when the Congress wants to add money. Um, Mark, can you speak more to um, the force structure points that you, you brought up earlier um, and, and where you see this in terms of uh, the right size or should it be bigger and you know where are we going with that um well it's a little surprising that four structure wasn't quite the bloodbath that was expected that's because there was more money in the budget at least they thought there was more money i think when uh the actual inflation gets factored in there's going to be a bloodbath but you know that's that'll be up to the congress i think they'll add a lot of money uh to to uh, take care of inflation um because there have been a lot of thought that particularly the army was going to be cut deeply in order to fund maritime and air capabilities uh, against China. Uh, I think two things happened. One was um, that the, the budget went up so they didn't have to take quite as much out of the army. Uh, the other thing that happened, of course, was Ukraine. And everybody you know, woke up to the fact that the United States has global interests, not just in the Pacific, and therefore you have to maintain maybe a stronger force in uh, Europe than the United States had uh, planned on doing. Uh, the other big thing that, that comes out is you know, this divest to invest and the fact that the services, particularly the Navy and the Air Force are retiring a lot of equipment. You know, the, Air, the Navy's taking out, I think, 24 uh, ships and adding only nine. Uh, if you look at their the size of the fleet over the course of the five years, it, it stays at about the 290 level. Whereas before they had been thinking they were gonna be going up to, you know, pick a number, 
you know, 320, 330. Of course, the Trump administration had put 320, uh, 55 on the table, but that was clearly unaffordable. Uh, and the Air Force is taking out, I want to say 500 aircraft over the course of the five years. <clears throat> and no, it must be, I think even more than that. Uh, so the Air Force is going to get smaller. Now, arguably, you know, the aircraft will be more um, capable. Uh, they'll be newer. They've got, they've got a tremendous uh, aging problem. But you do get this tension between capability and capacity. You know, how big the force is and, you know, how sophisticated uh, the equipment is. And the, the tension is seen in things like our response to Ukraine, because, you know, if you're going to deploy forces globally, if you're going to respond uh, to uh, aggression by Russia by sending forces to Europe, you got to have larger forces. Uh, if you're just going to focus on China, high-end fight, then uh, maybe a smaller force can, can do. And you see that tension playing out uh, in the services. Um, I'd like us all to talk more about Ukraine for a minute and how how does this affect the the budget and appropriations process going forward this year? I mean, the past few years, it's already been hard enough to pass an NDAA, extra hard to pass appropriations. It seems the only thing we can all agree on is everyone gets more money for everything. So now we can pass things, but now um, we have um, a new big conflict um, extreme suffering and big questions about what our role um, can and should be. How do you see that playing out in the different dynamics that are always at play in the appropriations process? For anyone. Well, let me talk about Ukraine first and then I'll let Wendy talk about the appropriations process. Um, um, I mean, Wendy was, uh, Ukraine was clearly a shock um, to uh, the national security community and to the world and had, a, I think, a big effect on U.S. national security strategy and that you know, increased focus on Europe and that focus is likely uh, to continue more money, uh, more forces there. A lot's going to depend on how the war ends uh, to get a sense about what the long term looks like. You know, the, the Russians are clearly not doing very well. Uh, you can imagine some outcomes where, you know, Putin gets overthrown and, you know, the Russian military collapses. I mean, it's not likely, but it's not impossible either. And if, you know, if that if we're in that world, you know, Russia is not going to be benign, but they may not be as threatening as we worry about. On the other hand, you know, if they do hang on to eastern Ukraine and continue to be uh, a revanchist power and uh, hostile to the West, you know, I think you'll continue to, you know, to see increases in defense uh, spending and concerns about security in Europe, you know, which, you know, the Europeans have, you know, awakened to. Um, so a lot depends on, on how the war comes out. Uh, okay, so I'll pick up on that. I agree with Mark's points, first of all, uh, uh, vociferously. I would hope that um, having that type of real world um, and it's on our TV every night or all day, actually, uh, a real world crisis will be a little bit of a kick in the pants uh, and that the budget process will move along a little more expeditiously um, and that the national security aspect of the budget will drag along everything else behind it, let's, let us hope. Um, I think practically, it's going to mean that we're going to have some sort of an emergency supplemental bill uh, because if you think about how much money the administration, how much uh, weaponry, and that weaponry costs something, so it's money, uh, how much weaponry the, the government, our government, has supplied to the Ukrainian government, uh, that's not coming out of thin air. That's coming out of a, of a bottom line. Uh, and so my guess is the most immediate response from a budget standpoint is we're going to have some sort of an emergency supplemental. Um, I'm, I'm hoping, as I said at the top, that this will not mean the return of the OCO uh, account. But um, I think emergency supplemental, and I will bet every person on this panel a martini uh, that we will have an emergency supplemental um, by the end of May. Who's going to take me up on it? I refuse to take you up on that, but, but <laughs> <Smart>. <laughs> I, 
I'm not sure about the end of May part, but uh, uh, but but I agree with the. Well, that's uh, the fun part of the bet. What's your bet, uh, then, Mark? Uh, you know, because I, I think that they're going to wrap two things together. They're going to wrap Ukraine and inflation together, and I think that may take a little longer to make an agreement on that. Good point. If if that's the case, then let's say uh, end of the second quarter. I'd like to try to chime in on Ukraine, I, I, I think, and I'm, I'm going to play the token historian on the panel again. I think it's important to put our, our Ukraine spending in, in context of the, the number of troops we have there. As I mentioned in the chart, we, we've had troops in Europe, we've had tens of thousands of troops stationed in Europe since the end of World War II, uh, and they're currently already there today. The U.S. has a lot of forces that are already there, independent of any supplemental, independent of any package we already do. And I think that's being lost in this context to say that the U.S. is doing nothing. Also lost in this context is the fact that our European allies, they've committed to increase their defense spending, too. So as we're thinking through these supplementals, I think it's important to understand where, where we are before we say, let's just go ahead and add more on top of that. Um. Go ahead, Monica. Yeah, if I can just round us off here um, with, with one more thing, kind of looking long-term about the impacts of Ukraine. Um, I think um, a lot of us are majorly concerned about what we've already seen in the erosion of arms control in the past uh, decade or two, but particularly looking forward about what this means for our spending on both nuclear and conventional like big ticket systems. Uh, the last remaining nuclear arms control treaty between the United States and Russia, the new START treaty, expires in less than four years in February 2026. And over the past year, the Biden administration was really trying to engage the Russians in negotiating a follow-on treaty. And actually through those dialogues, um, they were airing some grievances that led up to, to Russia um, invading Ukraine. But those talks have essentially collapsed. They're not talking anymore. Um, yes, there's still four more years, but negotiating a new treaty is going to be an extremely complicated matter. Um, there's a lot of uh, demands on both sides and it'll take a lot of time to get there. Um, once you add in this new level of really renewed hostile tensions between Russia um, and the United States, souring personal relationship between Biden and Putin, um, I, I think it's very possible that we could be looking at, um, if even before 2026, to not get too alarmist, a world where there's not a strategic um, treaty uh, or a treaty capping the strategic arsenals of both countries. And in that environment, we're going to see investments in intermediate range nuclear forces and hypersonic nuclear weapons, um, possibly expanding the nuclear modernization programs, unless there's something done. Um, both immediately and in the long term to, to, to lock down on this arms race. And that's all to say, not even talking about China leading into this as well. So I think that it, it's been an, an interesting moment, Ukraine, its impact on the nuclear policy and arms control conversation. And it could really go one of two ways. And, and one of those ways is unfortunately a, a, a renewed arms race, on, possibly unlike what we even see, saw in the Cold War. What good news. Um, I was also thinking, um, and this is for everyone, you know, there already is a European deterrence initiative, previously the European reassurance initiative um, goes by a lot of different things. Plus, there's also our relationship with NATO and commitments there. Can you guys talk about how um, those intersect and what role those might play in the upcoming um, budget and spending discussions. Yeah, I can start that. Um, uh, first, I would say that the Europe, from a budget standpoint, uh, the European Deterrence Initiative and our um, our commitments to NATO, from a budget standpoint, do not intersect. They are two different uh, pots of money. Uh, they are additive. Um, the uh, and uh, people who are interested in learning more about how NATO budgets work uh, can go to taxpayer.net and um, download a something I we call a five fast facts on the NATO budget. Uh, NATO budget is uh, uh, deeply misunderstood in my opinion. Uh, I worked on NATO policy in the Pentagon in a previous lifetime. Um, the there is a goal that was set uh, seven or eight years ago um, for all NATO members 
to spend 2% of GDP on their own national security. That is not that they take 2% of GDP and give it to NATO. That is not what, the, um, what NATO costs entail. Uh, there's something called the common funding arrangements. Uh, and by the way, that goal is by um, 2024, I think, the 2% of GDP for every NATO member. Now the US, as Mark and Ben both pointed out earlier, uh, spend about 3.3% of GDP right now on, uh, on defense. So we far outstrip it as do a, a few other countries including some you would be surprised to hear. Um, but the 2% um, the goal is for uh, uh, 2024. And within that 2% goal, they further agreed NATO members uh, to spend 20% of what they, what they personally spend on defense, on modernization, on new weapon systems uh, or improving current weapon systems. So then there are what's called the common funding arrangements, which is based on your gross national, your GNP, GNP. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm blanking on what it's called now, but anyway, uh, th sorry? GDP. No, that's okay. Uh, there's a percentage that you spend on um, uh, for common funding arrangements. And we, um, the United States altogether, uh, because of our, the size of our budget compared to most other NATO members, uh, we, we support 16.5% of the common funding arrangements. Common funding arrangements are literally keeping the lights on in NATO headquarters in Brussels. Uh, there's some um, uh, in intelligence uh, and surveillance things that NATO does as a whole. Uh, we, we support uh, those at the 16.5% level. Germany is the only country that they also spend, uh, pre, um, underwrite 16.5% of common funding arrangements for NATO. So it, the e, uh, economic deterrence initiative, when it was started in the Obama administration was a billion dollars for things that support NATO. And all through the documents that talk about the EDI budget, they talk about our NATO allies and our NATO commitments and our, but it is actually separate from what we spend as a member of NATO. So while those are separate, um, isn't there an overlap in terms of their policy goals and roles? Yes, absolutely. And, and throughout the document, the budget documents for EDI, uh, it, they are constantly referencing NATO goals or, or uh, NATO thresholds, that sort of thing. Mark, do you have any thoughts? So why do we need these two separate things? Well, the, the EDI came about as a result of you know, the Russian incursion into Crimea and the Donbass. And it was, it did three things. One is it arrested the U.S. drawdown of troops in Europe. You know, we've been taking troops out of Europe for decades since the end of the Cold War, and it stopped that, actually put some troops back in. Um, and it um, helped uh, uh, exercises with allies. So you got a lot more you know, NATO exercises. It also helped move U.S. forces to the east because U.S. forces had been in Germany and Central Europe. And now you know, with the threat to Eastern European uh, members of NATO, uh, we needed to move east. So there was a lot of um, uh, work on facilities in the east and you know, rotations of U.S. Uh, forces. So, um, uh, you know, so all for all, you, you got all three uh, responses as a result of Putin's actions in um, Crimea. And I'm just going to chime in and say I had to look it up because I couldn't remember the uh, what the uh, common funding arrangements is based on. It's actually based on gross national income, uh, our our portion of um, of the common funding arrangements. So that's why the United States and Germany pay such a large amount because gross national income for the two countries are the highest in NATO. Thank you. Well, before we turn to uh, some of the great questions we've received from the audience and please continue to submit them. Monica, can you talk more about this other big cost that um, 
we're facing in the upcoming spending fights as regards nuclear modernization. Yeah, so, so as I talked about a little bit, um, as a part of the nuclear modernization plans uh, that were agreed to, uh, negotiated, started, uh, began under the Obama administration, um, we're looking at somewhere between $1.5 to $2 trillion over 30 years on nuclear weapon spending. Um, this year, FY 2023, was one of the first years that we saw a really big bump in every single nuclear modernization um, program from the ground-based strategic bumping up ground-based strategic deterrent, that's the new ICBM that's actually now gonna be called the Sentinel. Um, it got its new name last week by the Air Force. Uh, a billion dollar increase in that program to 3.6 billion. The Columbia class new um, submarine is, is coming at around $6 billion this year. The B-21, the new strategic bomber at around $5 billion this year. All these nearly like around a billion dollar bumps from last year. None of this is a surprise um, under the modernization plans that we've expected. The, the peak of these weapon systems is actually not expected until the early 2030s. So they're gonna continue to climb and climb. Um, the major concern, and, and I'm gonna get a little bit into the, some of the smaller programs that I think will actually take up most of the oxygen on the Hill this year related to nuclear weapons. But the major concern for us is first, transparency in these numbers. Calculating the nuclear weapons budget is a very difficult task. Um, essentially, we go off one number every year that the Pentagon gives us on one slide of a briefing that they total up nuclear weapons spending. Um, and partially because these programs are, are set in a lot of different buckets, because some of them are classified, they don't detail what's out there. So we base our numbers off what they give us. This year, for example, it was 34.4 billion. They say they spend on nuclear weapons programs. Um, some of those programs cover areas like command and control that it's unclear what explicitly counts as a nuclear weapons program. Um, but there's a lot of confusion there, confusion there and it's hard to track. Um, in addition, there's also $16.5 billion this year in DOE spending on the National Nuclear Weapon, National Nuclear Security Administration's nuclear weapons spending. Um, and this is the major concern that I want to point out. Uh, as it's part of the difficulty in being able to track these is that it's also difficult to track how costs balloon. Um, the NNSA is, is, the pro, is the area of the nuclear modernization budget that it's most concerning as cost increases. Um, just going back two or three years ago, the projected numbers that they had for this year were around $2 billion less. So costs have not only increased, but they ballooned. Um, and that's a major concern. The GAO has repeatedly gone onto the Hill and testified that the NSA in particular does not seem to have a plan um, to match up all the tasks that it's been given um, with the costs that are expected and on the schedule that it ex it's expected. Um, CBO, who routinely estimates these uh, nuclear weapons numbers as mandated by Congress, repeatedly says, uh, none of our estimates are, are certain um, because these costs are changing. So tracking these costs and particularly not just the cost increases, but the cost ballooning is a major concern. Um, and I think that it's, it's going to lead not only to more spending, more taxpayer dollars used at the end of the day, but also hurt our strategic deterrent when warheads don't line up with their delivery systems um, and when there's a lot of controversy around these programs. And then just quickly, particularly digging into the fights on the Hill, um, there's two weapon systems that were cut in this year's budget. As I said, we don't actually see these cuts yet because we don't have the detailed budget documents. But as a part of the Biden administration's nuclear posture review, it's still not a classified version, but they've briefed um, the Hill on the classified version and the media a lot. They've said that they're cutting two programs from the nuclear modernization program. One being the B-83 gravity bomb. It's a 1.2 megaton gravity bomb. So the largest gravity bomb in the US arsenal. It's a Cold War legacy program that was agreed to be retired originally in the Obama administration mandated by Congress, but those plans were reversed under the Trump administration. And then the second, which is getting a lot of talk nowadays is the sea launch cruise missile, Slickum. Um, in short is another system that we used to have during the Cold War era. So nuclear capable strategic, um, uh, nuclear capable cruise missiles that would de be deployed not on our strategic submarines, but on our conventional attack submarines. This is a program that was renewed under the 2018 um, Trump administration's nuclear posture review, but actually didn't get its first funding start until last year under the Biden administration. But this, um, but the president has decided to forego development of the SLICM and to retire the B-83. 
Both of these have uh, these decisions, though not a surprise. We've called them low hanging common sense fruit. Frankly, I think that they were put in by the Trump administration to serve as a distraction from cutting anything else in the nuclear weapons modernization program, um, partially. Of course, there's people that think that we do need those systems, um, but both of these systems were the decisions to cut them were met with controversy from Republicans who have said that they will seek to restore funding for them. I think Democrats will be pretty universal in their opposition to both systems. Um, the B83 was uh, held, the life extension funding was held out by Democrats last year. The Slickum was a fight that some House Democrats in the appropriations um, bill kept out. But I think that it's going to take a lot of time and effort and a lot of uh, the arguments of especially in relation to Ukraine, will make the fight complicated. Um, so it's going to be an issue on the Hill. We have uh, particularly comments by Joint Ch uh, uh, Chief Chairman Milley and also by uh, STRATCOM Commander Admiral Richard, essentially straying away from the president, saying that they need these systems, not because of any new thing, but just because they believe every system is a better system to have, um, gives ammunition to this fight. And it's gonna be something that we'll be tracking throughout the NDAA and appropriations process this year. Yeah, and certainly complicated by world events. Um, we have some good questions I wanna make sure that we get to from the audience. The first is from Andrew and this from National Taxpayers Union. And this goes back to a comment that Mark, you made at the onset about um, the size of the Pentagon budget as a percentage of GDP. Andrew asks, what are the justifications for measuring the size of the defense budget as a portion of the nation's economic output? Plenty of policymakers and policy thinkers have used this measure, but why are we measuring the defense budget based on economic growth slash contraction? And the short answer is because it's a good measure of burden and therefore affordability. In other words, uh, uh, you could say that, you know, $700 billion is a lot of money. Uh, you know, if it, for a small economy, you know, it might be, uh, you know, a huge burden for a, a large economy, it's much less. Um, doesn't tell you about whether any of that money, you know, is worthwhile spending, uh, but it does tell you that in terms of the burden on the US economy, we're at an historic low. I, I... I will politely disagree, Mark. I, I think it's an incredibly flawed measure of defense spending, precisely because it's not strategic. It doesn't take account of your own capabilities. It doesn't take account of the threat environment that you're in. And it's also a measure we don't hear brought up um, when we have downturns in the U.S. economy. For example, in the 2008 financial crisis, the U.S. economy takes a big hit. We're in the midst of two wars. Should spending have gone down then? During COVID, when we had a big financial crisis here, should military spending have gone down? And you know, I can go back and look at the 30s, 1930s, the US economy tanks as Hitler is rising to power in Nazi Germany. I think there's too many counter examples to show how measuring defense spending as a percentage of GDP can be incredibly dangerous. Well, we, we disagree on this because I say it's, it's a good measure of burden and affordability. Wendy or Monica? You want to chime in on this <laughs> classic um, fight? Well, we have. Um, I literally don't have a dog in this fight. I have a dog here, but not in this fight. <laughs> um, Bill has a question about um, the number of troops that the U.S. might um, send to Europe, and I'm Bill. I'm going to politely say this is not a foreign policy discussion, it's a budget discussion, and we're not going to speculate on that unless someone really, really wants to, but I don't think that's uh, what we're going to do today. So sorry. And but let, let me say one, let me say one thing on, sure. on that. And I realize this is not a foreign policy, but of course, if the United States did send more forces, you know, that would get expensive. And I'm going to point out one place where Ben and I will agree, and that is uh, that. You know, the president has said we're not going to send forces into Ukraine to fight Russia. I think that's a very sensible thing. Uh, you know, having starting a war with a nuclear power, I think it's a really bad idea. And I am astounded at the number of people who otherwise rational people who say, you know, the time has come to take on Russia. We got to fight them sooner or later. So let's do it now. And I think you're out of your mind. You know, we went through the entire Cold War without fighting Russia. You know, we should not do it now. 
Mark, I could not agree more. <laughs> I said that very good agree. reminder. Thank you, guys. Um, we have another question from Christopher for Mark, um, but anyone else is welcome to chime in. How have resources been divided between the Indo-Pacific and Europe? Going forward, do you expect Congress and the Pentagon to seek to plus up the U.S. military presence in both regions? Uh, well, up until six months ago, I would have said that we're going to, um, you know, shift more resources to the Pacific. You know, maybe not as dramatically as some people would have wanted, but you would have seen some, you know, increase in forces over there and increase in capability. You know, after the war uh, in Ukraine and our push of forces into Europe, I think it's going to be much more uh, balanced. You know, that you listen to the administration's uh, national security um, statements. They talk about um, um, China being the pacing threat, but uh, uh, Europe, uh, Russia being the acute threat. So I, I think you're going to see both, frankly. Well, I, um, I have a surprise question that I just thought of for everyone. <laughs> Moving into some questions that I hope we can get through very quickly because we have um, so much to cover. Um, we all know that the president's budget is a dead letter, that it's kind of a, a wish list, that it has no force of law, it doesn't um, become what uh, the appropriation bills are. Um, some people, my own uh, boss, Jonathan Bidlack, among them say there's no point. Um, but do you think that the president's budget serves a role? And if so, what is it? Really quick. Uh, I do. Uh, I, I think it doesn't say, uh, serve the same role that it did 50 years ago, but I think it's still it, a budget is an expression of the priorities of an administration. And, you know, you, you can have all the policy in the world you want. If you don't have the money to enact that policy, you've got nothing. So I think it is still an important document. Of course I do. I'm a budget nerd. Uh, because it tells us the priorities of the administration. And then we, the Congress deals with those priorities. Anyone else? I mean, I would just chime in and say, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, every year, you know, you have the opposition saying, you know, the president's budget is dead on arrival. And then every year, you know, 98% of the, what the president asked for gets funded. Uh, you know, as a statement of priorities and as a starting point, I mean, it's very powerful. Okay, I'm going to combine Mike's question um, with this rapid fire portion. So keeping it very short um, for the speakers who would prefer to see lower levels of defense spending, what are the specific areas where it can be lower? Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in on that. I, I, I think first and foremost, you, you, you have to rein in our overseas bases. We, we have over 700 U.S. military bases overseas. We have troops in a majority of the countries in the world. Uh, bringing more of that back, I think, is an important place to start. Uh, I, I, I would also, and, and dare I say this on a defense budget panel, I would focus on uh, reforming the defense acquisition process. Uh, right now, near half or slightly over half of the defense budget goes to defense contractors. And the examples of waste, fraud, and abuse in that process are, are too numerous to mention. I would start in both of those two spots. Quickly uh, jumping, go ahead, jumping in here, um, the first without getting too much into it is Congress actually backing the weapon systems that the Pentagon is proposing need to be retired. Um, we receded, repeatedly see fights on this on the Hill. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest that go into this conversation, but I think uh, there needs to be more uh, attempts to follow what our, our military leaders are saying they don't need anymore in our legacy systems. And then part two, I obviously, as we've talked about, my view would be trimming excess in the nuclear modernization um, system and the nuclear modernization program. Uh, sure, we can maintain a triad, but why do we, for example, have to have 400 ICBMs? Why is that number the number that's set in stone when these weapons are extremely costly and Ukraine has shown us that nuclear weapons 
cannot be used in a conflict. They're extremely um, existential. They're extremely escalatory. So more conversations about what is the minimum deterrent that is need to protect the United States and its allies without um, spending on excess systems, whether they be strategic or non-strategic. And at TCS, we have for years said uh, you don't need to replace an, uh, the ICBMs. They're the least survivable leg of the triad. Uh, we can we can limp along with a dyad, uh, and I shouldn't I should not be glib. Uh, the dyad is more than enough uh, nuclear weapons to keep us safe, and also legacy systems. Uh, the Air Force. I always feel for the Air Force Secretary in in both administ uh, in uh, of both parties. Air Force secretaries have been retired attempting to retire legacy systems for at least 10 years that I've been paying close attention to it. And Congress has said no. Uh, it, if a military service says we don't need this anymore, we should be paying attention to that. I actually have some on my list, although I'm not, of course, um, uh, proposing big cuts to the defense. But you know, there are some overhead things that I think we could take a look at. BRAC, of course, is one of the things that people have, have raised. Uh, there's excess facilities that could be uh, closed down, save some money. And I think on the entitlement side, the military entitlement side, you know, uh, healthcare, for example, is, you know, extraordinarily expensive. Um, uh, but you, of course, you get tremendous uh, pushback. Um, uh, and I would point out to, to Wendy that one of the legacy systems the Air Force wants to get rid of is the A-10. And I believe you have opposed that. Not a text for common sense. We have not. Nope. Okay, now, I know some of your members have. At Pogo. <laughs> About that. Um, we have to wrap it up and we've barely scratched the surface. There's going to be so many um, flashpoints and challenges in the appropriations season to come. Um, but any words of advice that you have for Hill staff to leave them with or um, recommendations for what they should be keeping in mind as they approach the upcoming budget season. Final thoughts. Stay hydrated. <laughs> That's well, what I would tell them. <laughs> it's going to be a dynamic, dynamic year, and I hope they don't use that as an excuse to delay uh, you know, the appropriations and authorization bill is saying, well, we want to see how things settle down in Ukraine. We want to see how inflation settles down. We want to see that because, you know, that would be, if you waited for that, you, you, you'd never pass the bill. So I say, you know, get them out. You can make, you can do supplementals if you need to later. Very good advice. Regular um, funding on an anticipated schedule, I think is something we can all agree is very important for the proper um, dispensing of the federal government's roles. So question, anybody know when was the last year, I know the answer to this, when was the last time that all, back then it was 13 appropriations bills were separately, uh, were passed separately and prior to the beginning of the fiscal year, the last time that happened. No, not a full government CR prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. All 13 bills passed. 98? 94. So let's see that. 28 years ago. And that's what they call regular order. So explain to me why we still call that regular order 28 years ago. Is that your final thought, Wendy? <laughs> that is my final thought. Let's get back to regular order. I, agreeing with, oh no, oh. Ben, go first. No, please, please, Monica, please. <laughs> agreeing with Mark and Wendy on the need to get back to regular order, even as Wendy said, what is regular anymore? Um, I guess my my parting word would be, let's not fall into lazy arguments about how everything has changed. Um, obviously, Ukraine has, has shaken things up a lot. China increasing spending on its nuclear weapons, on its overall conventional forces. It's a new environment, but it's not something that 
the massive Pentagon budget hasn't been preparing for. So obviously there's going to be cost increase. We've sent a lot of weaponry. We've sent a lot of troops. Yes, we're going to need to pay for some things, but we don't need to pay for everything. So just as many people say, okay, we shouldn't just be talking about the top line increase. We should be talking about what we actually need to increase. I agree with that. So let's not just say, oh, let's add everything on the wish list like we did last year. And then at arbitrary eight more percent for inflation because everything in the Pentagon budget is going to be infected, affected by inflation. Have some hard decision, a conversations decision about what exactly are we vulnerable on, if anything, in regards to our force structure, our nuclear posture that has changed in the recent months without just providing um, more money to no end, covering every single scenario that we can think of. And I'll, I'll quickly pile on to that. I, I fully agree with Monica. Um, as you're going through this budget process, think about the trade-offs. Think about all these pressures there, there are to increase the, the Pentagon budget. Think about what those trade-offs are and do they actually, does Pentagon spending actually bring more security to your constituents who are sitting there? They're trying to deal with this inflation at home. They're trying to pay the bills. They're trying to navigate this crazy job market. Would those plus ups be better spent uh, in other areas that could bring them more financial economic security back here at home? I will just add another trade-off is deficit reduction, which would have a positive impact on inflation. Um, we clearly have so much more that we could discuss, but I don't want to take everyone's time. I do encourage attendees to please, again, reach out to these panelists for more information to um, discuss these issues further. Um, Wendy, Monica, and I are especially available for Hill staff who want to talk about specific reforms and amendment ideas. Um, if there are other offices that you would like to work with on these amendments, we're happy to help um, coordinate that. We know lots of good people who um, want to do effective things in the appropriations season to come. And um, you can also follow everyone on their various Twitter feeds, which are also in the bios document um, early on in the chat. And with that, I will say to our panelists, thank you so much for joining us, to our participants. Thank you also for taking the time out of your day to talk about this really important issue. And this is certainly not the end of this conversation. Thank you all. <laughs>